1999. That sentence brings me back to my senior kindergarten class when I was five years old, where we used to read out the date on the blackboard. The year 1999 was a stain on my mind, however, as a memory that will not go away no matter how hard I will try to forget it. 1999 marked the year I lost my first tooth, my first time on a plane, and unfortunately the early loss of my childhood innocence. That one memory that refuses to be white, it all started with that new or old TV. At the time, Pokemon was the latest fad to hit the school. Pokemon cards, games, stickers, and the most popular, the TV show. So of course every time I came home from school, I stayed glued to the TV until Pokemon came on at 5. The only problem was that my dad watched the news at 5.30. And Pokemon episodes are back to back. Which meant I would miss an episode every day. Something I whined on and on about. My dad finally got tired of hearing me complain every single day. And that must be why he went and bought another TV. My dad put the TV he bought in my room. Unfortunately, it was just an old, small boob tube with rabbit ears. It also only had about 20 channels available, not including the channel Pokemon was on. But I recall I didn't care though, I was just thrilled to have my own TV in my room. After surfing through the channels, I came to the conclusion that the only channel... 2. TiVo Kids was worth watching. So I watched that for a while. It wasn't for a few months when I discovered Channel 21. One day in April, I was th flipping through channels, trying to see if Pokemon was on. I pressed Channel 21 on the remote, hoping there were more channels. And to my delight, there was. My dad was very surprised as well. But he let me watch it because it seemed to have kids programs on. The channel was called Caledon Local 21, and I later found out it was indeed broadcasted from the town of Caledon, Ontario, a town very close to my city. The shows I saw on Caledon Local 21 looked poorly made, and I never understood what was going on in them half the time. However, as I grew up, every time I thought of that channel, I realized more and more how messed up the shows were, and I had to ask myself, what the fuck was I watching? The following is a list of shows and episodes I remember seeing on Caledon Local 21. How I remember such detail even disturbs me, but I guess things like this stand in your mind for a while. There are only three shows I could find on that channel. Probably because the channel is only operational between 4 p.m. and 9 p.m. April 1999. Booby. Episode 6. Together. I recall Booby was a show where the characters were simply live action hands. No puppets or anything else, just hands. The show featured a hand named Booby who found himself in a new situation every episode. The show was only about 5 minutes long and looked like it was shot in front of a damp decaying wall. With the hands always on the table with a red tablecloth. Very low budget obviously. This was the first episode I watched. The episode began with Booby trying to get ketchup out of a bottle. It actually showed him beating himself against the bottom of the bottle for a good three minutes. Finally, another hand came by and looked at Booby. Together, the other hand said. And it began beating the bottle as well. Until some ketchup finally squirted out all over the table. I remember chuckling slightly at that part. Booby then start, stared at the ketchup mess for a few seconds before turning toward the camera as it slowly zoomed in on him. 
Mr. Bear Cellar, episode 12. Very sketchy if you were to look at it nowadays. The show featured a guy wearing a bear mascot costume who would get a new visitor into his cellar every day. It was always a kid. The show was filmed on a camcorder and not a very good one either. The police asked me a lot of questions about this show. This episode started with Mr. Bear sitting at a table playing checkers by himself. I didn't recognize it at first, but this table was actually the same one from Booby. He sat there playing for a bit until there was a knock at the door. The camera then looked up the stairs at the door where there was another knock. Mr. Bear climbed up the stairs and opened the door to reveal two young children. One was a boy about my age. And the other was a little girl. And she looked about eight. Mr. Bear danced in delight and then started talking to the kids. I couldn't hear any of them that well, I remember. Mr. Bear then led the kids into the cellar, which was quite dark, only lit by a small oil lamp on the table. I can't really remember that much more except him singing a song I couldn't hear too well either, probably because that large bear mask. The episode ended with them playing hide and seek, with the kids hiding in a closet and Mr. Bear counting. May 1999 Soup and Spoon I didn't think this was even a show. I think it was more of a special movie kind of thing. All I know is I stopped watching Calendar on Local 21 for a while because I thought this show was too stupid. Especially since Pokemon now came on at 4.30 and 5. I don't remember much of this, but it showed a can of soup and a spoon both attached to strings, swinging back and forth, as if some was holding them or dangling them in front of the camera. Interestingly enough, the show was shot in a basement, which looked just like the one used in Mr. Bear's cellar. Like I said, I can't remember much. The only thing I can remember clearly was the end. The entire thing was half an hour. And just include stuff I found stupid. Such as a spoon chasing the soup around trying to eat him. The ending showed a table, the one from Booby and once again. And about seven kids sitting around it, each with a bowl of soup in front of them. They were sitting, looking at the camera, but with confused and almost frightened faces. The cameraman held the can of soup in front of the kids and said, Spoons ready! And then it just stopped. July 1999. It was summer. I hadn't watched Channel 21 for a while, until one day when I slept over at my friend's house. I decided to check it out again. My friend had gotten a TV in his room for his sixth birthday, so we stayed up very late. For us, 9.30 was very light. And watch TV. That's when I remembered Channel 21 and brought it up to my friend. We decided to see if it was on, and to our surprises, it was. They must have changed the broadcasting time. Mr. Bear's Cellar, Episode 23. This episode was entertaining for my friend and I mainly because it had swearing. However, now that I think of this episode, I realize something was definitely wrong when it was filmed. And the episode started with the camera on its side, while it was facing Mr. Bear, who was walking up the stairs to the cellar door. The camera then blacked out for about a second before fading back in and it was upright and facing Mr. Bear, who was... There was also another kid talking to him. 
but this kid looked about 11 or 12. He was talking to Mr. Bear for a while, but I couldn't hear well, again with the crappy camcorder, until the kid started raising his voice. The kid was saying it was late and his sister had to go home. You could hear more voices in the background. I remember Mr. Bear clearly saying, Get the fuck out! You're not invited! With a deep, muffled voice by the bear mask. I remembered my friend and I looked at each other and laughing at the mention of the forbidden F word. But the episode just got a little weirder. The kid began climbing the stairs before turning around saying he was going to call the police. Mr. Bear began breaking into a run toward the kid, who started screaming and running as well. The camera then cut out, and that was the end of the episode. The channel turned to static shortly after. Booby, episode 42. Playing with Scissors. One rainy afternoon, I was bored, so I decided to watch Channel 21. When I started watching, some show about a guy sitting in an armchair was just finishing. I forget what it was about, though. When I first saw the episode, I thought it was for teenagers, though, because it had blood in it, and it was very gross. When the police told me everything, I now know who the blood belonged to. The episode showed booby and another hand with a ribbon on, on it, on the pinky finger. Booby's girlfriend. Booby was holding scissors, hopping around back and forth, while his girlfriend so slowly swung around aimlessly. Another hand shot into the scene. This hand was smaller, though. It was jerking around violently, as if someone under the table was forcing the hand. I later found out that this was actually the case. Scissors, scissors are very dangerous, kids, so hold them safely, Booby said to the camera. I noticed I could hear muffled screams, but I wasn't sure if it was coming f where it was coming from, because the sound was so bad. Booby's girlfriend then grabbed the smaller hand, which was thrashing about, and Booby went at it with the scissors. He started with the thumb. He opened the scissors wide and clasped them onto the thumb. Blood began oozing out and muffled screams were very loud now. My five-year-old self was very grossed out and that's when I decided that maybe Booby was a show meant for teenagers or grown-ups. Then the scissors got to the bone. A horrible crunching noise was heard and that's when I turned the TV off. I never discussed it with my dad because he feared I feared he would limit my TV time. August 1999. I didn't want to watch Channel 21 after that booby episode. In August, I grew more curious to see Mr. Bear Seller for some reason. The last episode I saw Mr. Bear was weird. He had swearing, which made me think that the show was meant for teenagers. Nevertheless, I flipped on to Channel 21 when my dad was busy. Mr. Bear Cellar, Episode 28. Apparently this episode had been playing the entire month of August. It was studied a lot by the police. The entire episode was just Mr. Bear sitting in a chair looking to the audience. Hello, kids. Do you want to visit my cellar? If you do, please write me a letter at this address. The screen then switched to a white screen with multicolored letters reading the address. And that was remained for the rest of the episode. And guess what I actually did? I sent Mr. Bear, or that sick bastard who betrayed him, a letter. I did it out of curiosity, mostly. My dad was okay with it because he thought it was a legit kid show. But then again, he never saw any of what was on Channel 21. So, I wrote a letter using my best handwriting possible. 
I think I just said how I wanted to meet Mr. Bear and if Booby lived in the cellar as well. So my dad sent the letter to Mr. Bear. It stayed that that address stayed on all day anyway for some reason. So it was easy. It took about a week to get a response, which I was surprised I did. I still have the letter I received on August 15, 1999. The letter read, Dear Elliot, Thank you ever so much for your letter. I would love to have you in my cellar. We play games, watch movies, and go fire camping in the middle of the woods. And yes, Mr. Booby does live in my cellar. He's a very good friend of mine. Come to my house at... The police cut out the, this address. Caledon, Ontario, Camp. Camp. I looked very forward to having fun with you. Love, Mr. Bear. I cannot believe my dad never found this sketchy because he actually took me to the house and that's when the police became involved. The endless questions, those pictures of those ter terrified kids, the woods. That brings me to why I'm writing this blog. That psycho and his friends did some fucked up shit back then. And now it seems he's trying to get into contact with me again. The entire police thing is coming back. And that has brought 1999 back to me. Over a decade later, it is happening again. Update. 9-21-2011 People have been emailing me asking what exactly happened in 1999. I will get to that. Those weird TV shows I was watching apparently were meant to attract kids to Mr. Bear's house. What Mr. Bear did shocked the entire town. My dad actually drove me to Caledon along with the address Mr. Bear left on the letter. The house is actually in the outskirts of town, in open farmland. I still remember that house. It looked like an older farmhouse that looked like it had been built in the early 1900s. The windows were all boarded up, and the house looked in a state of despair. As we walked up to the house, I remember my dad checking the address over and over again, looking at the house in disbelief. And then the door opened. I expected to see Mr. Bear to be at the door, but I was surprised to see police emerge from the creaking doorway. The officer began talking to my dad, until I quickly asked if that was Mr. Bear's house. The officer's face cringed slightly and muttered, Oh God, or something like that. He started talking quietly to my dad so I couldn't hear. Although, my dad told me to go to the car anyway. And then we went home. My dad was quiet the whole way home. I felt something strange had happened. My dad never told me what happened for a while. I forgot about it anyway, too. Channel 21 was no longer on, and when I asked about it to my dad, he would not even acknowledge his existence. I think it was when I was 13 where I learned the truth. I remember the, ch the channel one day and asked my dad about it. I guess he finally decided that I should hear the truth. Caledon Local 21 was a local TV channel that ran from October 1997 to August 1999. The Peel region of Ontrello. The entire channel was made from a house in Caledon, the one I visited, and ran by a man who was not really known by anyone in the town. The channel was only available to older TVs because of the signal that one picked up by rabbit ears, weaker frequency. 
The man created all the shows on the channel. All the... Which were kids shows. His hand was booby. He was Mr. Bear. And he was also the mysterious cameraman. The real reason he created the channel was more disturbing than what was originally thought. As you might have already guessed, he kidnapped kids, held them in his cellar, and while most people thought he was a serial, serial child molester, he really wanted to use the kids for another purpose. The day I arrived, the man had fled his house the night before, the day before the police went in for their investigation. I wasn't the only one who was watching. Update 11-9-2011 I'm sorry for not answering questions for so long. I haven't accessed my email account for quite some time. Anyway, let me finally set something straight about what I know. Back in October, I visited a house previously owned by the man who ran Caledon Local 21. Two women lived there, operating a daycare business. How ironic. Now, to answer the questions you guys emailed to me. Question. Who else watched Local 21? Answer. I know other people watched it for sure, including those kids who wound up in Mr. Bear's house. After some Google searches, I found some people on a Now Seeker forums who were discussing shows from Caledon Local 21. They talked about the kids' shows I watched, but also two other shows I have never seen before. A user named I Am Real Life seemed to know all about the shows that were broadcast on Channel 21. Here are the two I never heard of. The Fallen Angel and Life I Am Real Life described it as a fairly boring show about a guy rambling on and on in front of a camera how he must please Satan and appease him before it's too late. Paint with the Soul I Am Real Life and another user called Siggy92 were discussing this show. They described it as a Blair Witch-like and very interesting. I'll go looking for the conversation, and if I see it, I can get the link. Question. Where is Mr. Bear, or the guy who wore the costume? Answer. If I did know, I would have said earlier. I have no idea where this guy is. Or if he's dead or alive. Hopefully dead. When I see my dad's friend next time, I will ask him about this. Maybe I can get more details later. What did Mr. Bear do to the children? This is by far the most common question I have been asked. I found out in October as well via my dad's friend who was a retired Caledon regional officer. Apparently the man playing Mr. Bear took the kids out of the house and into the forest nearby. What he did there, police are not exactly sure how it happened. But 16 charred bodies of children between the ages of 4 and 13 were found in a 15 by 15 foot ditch deep within the forest. My dad's friend didn't want to go into exact details, but I'm seeing him next Thursday anyway, so maybe I can extort more information from him then. That is all I have for now. Thanks for keeping an interest in my blog, and I'll try to gather as much information as I can for my next post. I actually been getting pretty interested in this myself. It should be my right to know what the hell happened then. Update 2-1-2012 I am sorry I haven't posted anything for a while. I kind of lost interest in this blog since I hit a stand Still, while looking for more information about the identity of the owner of Local 
2021. However, a few weeks ago, I struck gold. I found some answers surprisingly from the father of a kid I used to babysit. He lives just across the street and I used to look after his kids when they were younger. He currently doesn't have a job either. He used to live near the woods outside of Caledon and witness the owner's activities in the woods. His name is Anthony Polo. He lived in a small bungalow outside the woods and often would venture in to smoke a joint of marijuana or two before returning to his work as a wood craftsman. Polo described that there had sometimes he would hear voices of the children coming from deeper within the woods as well as a glowing light off into the distance. Polo told me these events started in the late 1997. No, this is around the time local 21 Ben Aaron. He apparently became annoyed by this happening every once in a while and actually went to investigate. Polo then described what the whole scene had looked like when he got there. There was a group of kids. He said about 13 to 17 and ages 5 to 12. He gathered around a large fire pit with a burning fire. When with them was a single adult. Polo talked to the man. Noting his unusual, unkempt appearance of a cracked edit, as well as his, as his constant twitching. He asked what he was doing in the forest with the children. The man said that they are ca on a camping trip, something they did rather frequently. Polo, not suspecting anything, Caledon was one of the lowest crime rates in Canada. Simply left it at that and told him to be quieter. Polo then paused for a while before telling me that it never really became quieter. In fact, sometimes he heard loud chanting from the children in an unknown language. He didn't bother meeting with the man again. He was moving away anyway. I told Polo that the man was probably the owner of Caledon Local 21, but he doubted it as he heard that the man was moving to Pickerig by several other residents near the area. Here's what I know. The man would take the kids into the woods for regular camping. The fire pit Polo described may be the hole that the bodies of the children were found in. The children Polo saw were probably the ones found dead. And the man who moved to the city called Pickleburg, a smaller east of Toronto. I will discuss this with my dad's friend, the ex-cop, and see if this matches anything the police knew about the man. I also want to see if he has other knowledge of what aired on in Local 21. Good news guys, I talked to my dad's friend and he disclosed a lot of information for me. First I asked if the police had found any more information on the man who ran Caledon Local 21. He replied that they had the same leads for years and never found a suspect. However, the Peel Regional Police did have some tapes found in the house Caledon Local 21 was broadcasting from. He took me over so I could watch a few. I guess I haven't said much about him yet, haven't I? My dad's friend's name is Mitchell Wilson. He's a pretty nice guy. He seems to understand my thirst for knowledge on what happened during the late 1900s in that house. He feels it was wrong that my dad went so long without telling me much. He took me to Davis Road Police Station. 
if you don't know, that is the largest station in Caledon, and one of the largest within the Peel region itself. Each of the main stations around Peel have some of the tapes. The Davis Rose, I got to watch all of them. Unfortunately, I wasn't allowed to take any home for obvious reasons. Booby. Episode 2. Friends are like flowers. This is one of the first booby episodes made. The camera quality looked crappier than usual, probably an even older camcorder. But the scene was in the same place as the booby episodes usually took place. I recognized it instantly. The episode began with booby swaying back and forth constantly with for a few seconds before another hand entered. The other hand was much smaller and looked like if it belonged to a young child. The smaller hand eagerly began bouncing around before sliding up the booby, bringing its fingertips together to kiss booby. After a few seconds, booby began grabbing the smaller hand and squeezing it tightly. This continued for at least 10 seconds before the camera slowly panned left until the hands were out of sight. The camera began panning until it slowly showed a wilted daisy lying by itself. The camera then zoomed in on the daisy slowly as the little girls began audibly saying, Friends are like flowers in the garden of life. And then the episode ended. Paint with the Soul, Episode 10, Garbage Thrown Away. Paint with the Soul is one of the shows that I in real life and Siggy 21, I mean 22, discuss on Now Seeker. I told the police about this, and they informed me that just 12 episodes of the show were made and broadcast between December. 5th, 1977, and January 8th, 1998. Exactly as I in real life in Siggy 92 described, the episode opened with a cameraman wandering around in a forest. It appeared to be during the evening as the sun was just setting. The cameraman walked along the path until he got to an area where there was a lot of garbage laying in the leaves. The camera looked around the various wrappers, bottles, bags, making sure each item got a few seconds of screen time. The camera then focused on to a single area before the man spoke. I recall he spoke in a very timid, quiet voice, and I swear I've heard it somewhere else before, like on another Caledon Local 21 show. I could barely hear what he was saying, but he mainly talked about how humans are garbage or something that had to with saving ourselves by cleaning up the garbage, aka us. It actually sounded really stupid, but still a feeling of dread came over me. I mean, that forest was possibly where those bodies were found, right? Mr. Bear Cellar, Episode 25 when the police administrator brought this tape in, I actually said, oh shit, and chuckled a, a bit out loud. Of course, I got stares from the staff, but Wilson explained to them about my little experience with Mr. Bear, and how I kept the letter he sent to me. Like the previous episode, this one included a guy wearing a bear mascot costume. The episode began with Mr. Bear waddling over to the red cloth table with a bottle of orange juice in his hands, or should I say his paws. On the table were 16 shot glasses as well as a small bottle that contained an unknown liquid. Mr. Bear poured an equal amount of orange juice into each glass before opening the smaller bottle and depositing one drop into the glasses. Mr. Bear then went off camera. 
There was some minor sounds such as shuffling and then Mr. Bear emerged from behind the camera's location. Following him were 16 children. Some of them looked as young as four, others looked like they were practically teenagers. As the children entered, the administrator commented that this is the only episode that showed all 16 victims. The kids all looked rather content except for this one who had visible bruises on his face. Unlike the other kids, he had a more fearful expression. He looked about 11 or 12, which caused me to recognize him at once. He was the kid who asked about his sister and subsequently met an unknown fate at the end of episode 23. That one episode I watched July 1999. When I told the administrator this, he confirmed it was the same kid. He was also featured in episode 24, an episode that only aired once at 3 o'clock in July 1999. The police have not still found the tape. Mr. Bear then broke into song, singing about citrus fruit and how good vitamin C was for you. I could barely hear the lyrics as they were muffled by his bear mask. And the kids all drank their juice. The one from episode 23 doing it rather reluctantly. And then the episode ended. After viewing three tapes in possession of the Davis Police Road Station, I'm satisfied. But only temporary. I still want to know the full story. The police just kept giving me the same crap about the creator of Caledon Local 21 being a f fe fetish pedophile as well as an apparent cultist. I will sign off for now. Get into university first, get information later. Hopefully I will get back to this blog as soon as possible. Update 5-12-2012 On April 17th I finally got my G2 license. In Ontario Canada, this allows you to drive a car by yourself as well as some passengers after six months. I, of course, took advantage of this and drove into Calavon for a little Sunday drive. Since I haven't updated this blog for a while, I figured I might as well visit the house where the infamous channel of my childhood was located. The house looked different than when I last saw it in October. The place was no longer used as a daycare and just sat there abandoned. However, it did have a for sale sign so showing that someone still owned it, wanting to get rid of it. The abandoned house drew fuzzy memories from my mind, mainly about the day that my dad took me to visit Mr. Bear. A feeling of dread came upon me. What happened to those children that were living in that house? I walked up to the steps to the front door and peered through the window. Inside I could see a nearly empty hallway with a few boxes at the end. At the end of the hallway to the right was an open doorway presumably leading to the kitchen. To the left were two doors, apparently leading to the rooms visible through the windows outside. I wondered where the cellar entrance was located and whether it had been sealed up. I walked around the back of the house and found my answer. Two wooden doors laying at almost a flat angle were padlocked shut. This had to lead to the cellar. Not wanting to hang around, you can imagine what was going through my mind at that time, I departed. Depi I mean, behind the house, the empty field continued on until it reached a dense forest that lined the horizon. I wondered if it was the forest where the bodies of the children were found. I thought to myself, fuck it, and proceeded to walk across the field behind the house into the forest. The forest was oddly quiet, save for the few paradox sounds of a woodpecker drilling into a distant tree. 
I cautiously made my way deeper into the woods, not caring about the fact I had no idea where I was going. I didn't know how to explain it, but it felt like there was something I had to find. I came to a thinner part of the woods and a few small houses in the distance. Polo's house crossed my mind. I wondered if it was one of the homes had belonged to him. I neared a small clearing in which I could see three adequately sized logs around a black charred area, showing a small fire had been lit recently. Hey, get the fuck out of our fort! Those words nearly gave me a heart attack. I turned to my left and I saw two dark clothed people running toward me. My initial thought was to run, however they came closer and I saw that they were just kids, basically in their early teens, possibly 13 or 14, maybe even 12. As they approached me, they s realized my size as well. I'm 6'1", while they could have been no bigger than 5'8". One might have been 5'7". We said, get the fuck out. The larger one was wearing a slipknot shirt and a half, and said it half-heartedly. I stood my ground and shrugged. The shorter one, who was wearing a Metallica shirt, swung out a butterfly knife and held in my direction. No, you wouldn't want to, I said in a deep, serious tone, trying to sound as badass as possible, pulling out my cell phone on the process. The, the two kids withdrew. The one in the Metallica shirt putting away the knife. Look, dude, we don't like people in our fort, so can you just go? The one in the Slipknot shirt said, obviously intimidated. I had no business in the forest anyway. I ordered out a simple, fine, and turned before I realized I had a great opportunity. Did either of you hear of a guy who murdered a bunch of kids in these woods about mm, 13 years ago? I asked the kids. The two looked at each other in confusion before the one in the Metallica shirt answered, Yeah, everyone knows about that guy. He said it to me as if I were stupid. The kid in the Slipknot shirt continued, He still lives around here in the storm drain. My brother's friend said he saw him in a bear costume once wandering around the forest at night. My instincts told me that was probably a lie. The owner of Caledon Local 21 is probably long gone, only existing as folklore in this small, isolated community. However, as a human, I thought of the mysterious unknown sparks interest within. And where is the storm drain? I asked, just out of curiosity. I don't actually believe the kid's story. The kid in the Metallica shirt stared at me for a few moments, his eyes seemingly full of annoyance, yet curiosity for me. You're not from around here, are you? Why did you even come here? Now, I do admit, I was slightly startled by the nature of this question. However, I find... I might as well explain why I was there. Just in case people mistook my intentions. I told the two kids about my experience with the man and Caledon Local 21, and that I have come to maybe seek some sort of closure, although even I wasn't exactly sure why I was here. The, se the kids seemed familiar with the channel as they smiled and looked at each other while when I mentioned it. They also became more understanding and gave me a detailed description on how to get to the storm drain. Shortly after, I decided to just turn around the way I came and head back to the house, leaving the kids at their fort. But you're probably wondering why I let, left out such detail on what the kids told me just now. It is because I am choosing to conclude what I have gathered now. Here's what the kids told me in detail. The storm drain lies ahead of the kids' fort, in the same direction I was going. The drain ends at a small river where water is drained out, near a small playground. The kids told me people rarely use it. 
The man supposedly lives in a large pipe that the water drains out of. People have seen him, although always wearing either a bear mask or a full body costume. No, I do not believe this is true, but the fact is simply a myth by the residents of Caledon. The story does not seem plausible in any way. Why did no one call the police? Didn't this guy look suspicious? And other questions like this ha have this story really weird. I may visit the storm drain, not because I believe the story, but because I want an excuse to visit Caledon again, so this blog doesn't die. With no more tapes to watch, I don't know what to talk about anymore. Thanks for continuing to support my blog. I know many are looking forward to more information about what happened to Caledon in the year 1999. And I will do my best to continue my research into the topic. Elliot, out. Ten for 2012. Wow, nearly five months since I last updated. I am guessing everyone pretty much thinks I am dead, right? Thankfully, I am not. But in all seriousness, I have been really busy in the past few months. And a blog about something that could have killed me as a kid is a little low on my current priorities list. As of now, I am living in Wat Waterloo, Ontario, attending the University of Waterloo for computer engineering. Yeah, I'm a keener. As you can imagine, engineering is no walk in the park, so obviously, I nearly forgot about this blog. But as you can see, I am back. I remember to visit the storm drain from the that the kids told me about. It was out in a clearing between two wooded areas, nearby a marsh. Unfortunately, I found absolutely nothing, save for a turtle that retreated into his built-in home when he saw me. I snapped a few pics of the pipe, which I posted as well. Also, let me tell you, it was not a storm drain like they said it was. What I saw was a simple pipe possibly to channel across the water from the marsh. When I returned to the Caledon, however, I simply put kept putting off everything until I forgot about my blog. It just didn't seem important anymore. Please forgive me. It wasn't only until recently that I am now interested in my case. On September 10th, I received an email from this email address. Return the B at hotmail.com. Funny, am I right? When it gets better, I'm going to copy and paste the exact email the guy sent to me. Dear Elliot, my dear, dear boy, I missed you ever so much. Oh, how you've grown. Your twinkling eyes have stayed the... Same, however, those eyes looking for adventure, oh, how imagining them brings warth, warmth to my old bear heart. That day you came to visit me, I felt so happy I wanted to go out and pick strawberries. He told me you would come looking, oh yes, he told me you would come looking. Now, it will be soon, you won't be lonely soon. I am ever so sorry I couldn't say hello when you came to visit, not once, but two times. Do not fret, however. You will soon get to play with the other children. I will try making my cellar even cozier than before. 100 fuzzy hugs, Mr. Bear. Now obviously this letter's fake, but I would like to thank whoever sent it. Just reading this letter creeped me out, but because of it, I am now full into this again. I guess it is. I guess it's just funny trying to pursue the mysteries I have already, I have always questioned. Now my roommate knows all about this. He thought the letter was real, and he actually seems more scared of it than I was for a second. 
but then I shrugged it off, and so did he. I mean, what are the chances of this being real? And how would Mr. Bear know I went to Caledon on those occasions? More or less, know my email, or still be interested in it in his cellar. HA! I am going to simply reply to return the B. Wow, just looking at this email address, you can tell someone wanted to freak me out. It didn't really work, though. Although, to wherever you are, thank you for sparking my interest back into the full matter. Maybe I can find out more about what happened to Mr. Bear. Hopefully because, although I didn't buy the email, a part of me still feels anxious. Thank you to all those who are following me, and have become avid fans. You are also why I'm choosing to continue this. Thanks, guys. Update! 11-9-2013 Wow, I can't believe this blog hasn't been deleted yet. I haven't posted anything for so long. I have my reasons, and I'd rather not discuss them just yet. It's been a rather traumatic year for me. Some of you are right. I shouldn't have gone back trying to relieve the mysteries of my childhood. But I just couldn't resist. It's been over a year since my last post, and a lot has happened. So let's recap where I am right now with regards to the whole Mr. Barrett incident. Return the B at Hotmail.com is no longer in use. I tried replying to the email, but I got no reply. I tried again back in March, still no response. I've actually moved up to Ottawa, capital of Canada, for those who don't know, for university, so I haven't gone back to Caledon or back home in the Peel region for a while. I had my reasons for leaving, as you could guess why. I had to make a new account because people kept prank mailing me pretending to be Mr. Bears. Thanks a lot, guys. Not. Why I have ventured back into this blog. Mitchell Wilson, remember my dad's ex cop friend? Gave me a phone call on October. 23rd about a tape that was found on a in a branch of the Brimpton Public Library. Brimpton is my hometown in case you haven't picked up on that. He claims he isn't allowed to discuss the contents of the tape with me as it is still in evidence, but he asked me to come check it out when I return home. That tape got the gears grinding again, because we all know what was the last tapes I saw. I can only imagine what could be on it. I'm guessing it must be something to do with Caledon Local 21. I guess I wanted to say I am continuing this blog. Thank you for everyone that still follows it. I don't know when my ne next entry will be, but when I see that tape, I will write what I find. I don't know what to expect, but the idea of seeing the tape has gotten me interested in this whole mystery all over again. Elliot. Update. 1-16-2014 It's been a long year for me. University has been giving me the usual sleepless nights, especially since I transferred to Ottawa. The place to party. But now I'm back home with my dad in Brimpton, the town I grew up in. I got home on the 8th of De 18th of December and have been visiting my friends and family. Or at least what I would rather have done. Now, that festive holiday cheer I usually have at this time of the month is absent. To answer the hundreds of emails and comments I got, yes, I did see the tapes that my dad's friend, Mitchell Wilson, promised to show me. The tapes, however, act as a curse. I want to know more, yet I want to forget everything. I couldn't help it. I needed to see those tapes. Not only for myself, but for all of you guys who are just as intrigued as I am that 
by that ominous man in the bear suit from my past. However, after viewing those tapes, I feel a bit of dread deep inside me once again. That feeling where I know all those kids in those videos are dead. That I could have been one of those kids. And that humanity is a dark, dark place. If you haven't skipped through this paragraph for the juicier details below, thank you for listening to my rambling. On Friday, Wednesday, January 1st, I called Mitchell Wilson and asked if there was time where I could come by and view the tapes. Things were pretty slow at the station because of a snowstorm, so he said I could come down any time that day. The tapes were located at a branch not too far from me, so I braved the slushy roads and the terrible Brempton drivers and made my way to the Peel Regi Regional Police Station located at the Brimala City Center. I met Wilson at the front desk where he had led me to the second floor into a small office. He introduced me, he instructed me to have a seat and wait while he went and got the tapes. Before leaving the office, he turned around and said, I know you're curious, but are you sure you want to do this? Of course I did, or at least I thought I did. Because Miss Wilson's friend had pulled a lot of strings to get me there, and I didn't want to waste the opportunity. This particular station had four tapes on hand. I was only al allowed to watch three of them, however, because the fourth tape was apparently too damaged to be played on a VCR. Paint with the Soul, Episode 3 How to Dust a Room I'd almost forgotten about this show. I never did see it on TV, but I did see that one episode at the Caledon Police Station. The episode opened up, the camera panning around a small empty room. The window on the wall, the opposite door. Outside, it was a was it was pretty much light out. The cameraman walked towards the window, revealing a small clearing before a dark, thick forest about 15 feet from a, the window. The cameraman panned around to face the door and finally spoke. T Today, I'm go g gonna sh sh show you. How to pr pr properly dust a room. I recognized the cameraman's voice as the same from before. Quiet, timid. Only this time with a clear stutter. Now here's where things got weird. The cameraman aimed the camera at his feet, revealing a, mental, a metal broomstick. Grabbed it with his free hand. His hand was that of a white male, so it was easy to see the fresh, bright red blood that covered it. The man then explained that in order to get the room nice and dusted, you had to make sacrifices. And with that, the man began to smash the white plaster ceiling with the broomstick. Soon, there was a significant hole in the ceiling, revealing the wooden slates that made up the roof. The floor is now pretty messed up with chunks of ceiling littering the floor, as well as a coating of plaster from the ceiling. The man aimed the camera at the floor and began to smash the larger ceiling pieces with his feet. The man then backed up to the door and had the camera show the mess he had created. And, and, and now the room is is the episode ended before he can finish. Wilson warned me that the next two state tapes were more disturbing. I insisted to keep watching, although a voice in the back of my head told me I shouldn't. Booby, episode 30, Children of the Light. It was Booby, one of the shows I actually watched as a kid. I had never seen this episode before, and now I wish that that were still true. 
The episode opened up the same way as every ep other episode I've seen. A single adult hand, Booby, was rocking back and forth. After a few seconds, Booby turned toward the camera and said, Songs are sung, the best ones sung by children. The hand had disappeared out of view below the table. After a few more seconds, the picture suddenly cut to outside. Aiming at the bonfire in a small pit. It was night and it appeared to be in a small clearing in a forest. Although it had it was hard to tell because of the camera quality. The camera then zoomed into the fire which was burning fairly steadily. Suddenly a human hand was forced into the fire by a pair of adult human hands. The hand was small, presumably belonging to a child, and was being held firmly in place by two larger hands. Sound was absent for the first few seconds until a song began playing, a song I recognized from my childhood. I would sing it in church or at school. I went to a Catholic elementary school. And the song began playing as the hand was being held in the orange flames. It continued as the hand struggled to escape the larger hand's grasp. It continued as the flesh of the hand began to turn beet red and peel away. It continued as dark smoke began raising from the hand. It must have taken only a few minutes for the hand to become black and save for a few instances of white bone visible under the charred flesh. Fuck! That image is burned into my mind. The hand was now limped and no longer moved. That's where the episode ended. Mr. Bear's Cellar. Episode 30. Mr. Bear never ceased to disturb me, especially after what almost happened when I was younger. This episode took place outside in a dark forest, making it slightly hard to see, especially considered the quality of the film. A trademark of anything from Caledon Local 21. The episode started with the camera being held in the paws of Mr. Bear aiming it at himself. That bear mask it looked more sinister in the shadows of the trees. The unmistakable muffled voice spoke up. Hello children, today I will be doing a wonderful thing for my friends. I will be delivering them to a faraway land where they will surely be happy. Mr. Bear turned the camera around to show an ATV with an attached trailer. But what stood out the most was that the trailer contained seven more motionless children laying side by side. This, this is the first load. But more will be on their way soon. Mr. Bear turned around and pointed the camera to a large burlap trap spread on the ground. He picked up the tarp, revealing a large hole that must have been at least 12 feet deep and maybe about 15 feet wide. The rest of the episode consisted of what Mr. Bear taking each kid and dropping them into the hole. I asked Mr. Wilson if they were dead, to which he shook his head and replied, Not yet. Soon all the kids were in the pit. Some were in awkward positions being tossed in, but remaining unconscious. The vitamin C will surely help these children on the great journey that awaits them. The Mr. Bear mentioned as he panned the camera toward multiple bottles of gasoline beside a bush. The camera zoomed into the bottles as Mr. Bear hummed before the episode ended. Wilson revealed to me that these were seven of the sixteen victims found burnt to a crisp. The gasoline is what the man playing Mr. Bear used to light them on fire. A pit full of 
burning children. Who the fuck would do that? A feeling of dread found me once again when I realized I could have been one of those kids. Wilson then explained to me that he had previously lied to me and the Ford tape owned by the Bremela police branch in did indeed work and contained the filming of the actual burning. However, he felt like I wouldn't be able to handle the disturbing and graphic nature of the episode. And you know what? Maybe I couldn't. I don't even want to see it. I am satisfied, f satisfied for now. I just need some time to get myself together. The thing is, the man who ran Caledon Local 21 is still out there. More to come soon. Elliot.